This is Fight Fans Radio. All right, guys, welcome to BJJ Attic Radio. Uh, tonight we have Dracolino on, the one and only. I'm Real DWC, a.k.a. David Carroll, and I'm here with... Jero LP. As usual, let's get right into it, guys. We're going to call him up. Uh, sorry about the technical difficulties that we've been having, but uh, hopefully you stay tuned. And if you didn't have to deal with it, then uh, even better, you're listening to it after the fact, and uh, it's going to be a beautiful interview. Let's uh let's get this going, guys. I am pumped up and drank a lot of coffee, so <laughs> I'm really hyped up right now. Yeah, very. I don't know how people do drugs because this is insane coffee. <laughs> oh god, I can hear it already. Hello. Hey, sorry about that. No problem, man. I mean, I think it was actually your phone because. Seems like I have full signal here, but that's okay. And I'll have a landline. Definitely, definitely. It was, uh, you know, there's no more to say. It was, uh, it was my producer's fault. Uh, she's very <laughs> sorry. Make sure, make sure you choke him out there. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll definitely do a good choke. All right. So, yeah. Before we got cut off, I, I did want to ask you about uh, the old school being the best school, and and if you really did feel that way, yeah, uh, like I said, I was saying, and then it got cut. But uh, it's kind of like uh, you know, it's kind of like a funny thing to say. I'm a big fan of the new techniques, and I was always like up to date to my jujitsu. But I feel nowadays that people are trying to do like shortcuts in jujitsu. They are learning jujitsu uh, kind of in an upside down way. You know, they don't have any foundation, any solid foundation to learn uh, th this latest techniques. I mean, it's kind of an example, like they're learning the betting bolo before they learn how to escape from a headlock. You know what I mean? So that's, that's my concern and my kind of, I'd say, objection about that new school uh, 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 thing that people talk nowadays. You know, like it's, it, it has to be kind of like you build a house. You have to build the foundation first and a solid foundation, and then you go from there. You know, that, that, that's why I said that. Uh, saying this, do you experiment uh, with the Barambolo while they're training or Man, other like, new flashy techniques? It's actually funny that people say that because uh, I got an email the other day that I thought was pretty cool, actually, uh, from a guy from the Philippines. And uh, he saw like w one match that I did back in 1998 against uh, Marco Pahupinha. It was actually the same night that Royce Gracie fought Valides Mayo that Valides Mayo choked him uh, on, a, on a clock choke. Uh, and I did a lot of De La Riva God on that match. And he was saying, Professor, you're trying the betting bolo there all the time. <laughs> and I mean, and that's right. I mean, it was kind of like a re very, like, uh, not as sophisticated as today, but it was definitely the same concept. I was trying to go from the De La Riva to the back. And I actually almost did that a couple of times. And uh, it, it, it's not that I don't experiment the betting bowl, you know, like I, I, I love it. It's a great thing. I just don't think that if you don't master, if you don't know how to do some things uh, before doing the betting bowl, you shouldn't be stick to doing the betting bowl. You know what I mean? Like I'm never going to teach a betting bowl in the fundamentals class, for, inst for instance, you know, that's, that's my, my thing. I mean, I think it has to be uh, on its right time. That's my only concern about it. Well put. Now, this is kind of weird. This is all going in this trend, but is Samuel Braga not one of your students? He is my student. Yeah, he was always my student. Since, and you know, wiped out. And he is supposedly the founder of of the Birambolo. Yeah, he is in in like, in, in, uh, in a sense that you know a lot of people say the Birambolo nowadays that is like uh, done pretty much when uh, when but when that's the double pull guard thing. When people, two people pull guard at the same time, and definitely Samuel 
was the first one to do that from that perspective, you know. And uh, Samuel, of course, also was the first one to do, uh, as we say, the modern way. Of course, he got the, 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 the idea from me because he learned from me, and I'm, I was always like a lot into uh, Spider God and De La Riva God. But, I mean, of course, he made it better. And uh, I agree. I mean, the modern burning bolo, the creator, was indeed, no question about it, Samuel. Nice. I just I just found that always funny how like uh, something like you you were saying you played around with it in the the mid '90s. I mean, yeah. the late '90s. It, it's unbelievable how big it is at this exact moment. Uh, and, and you're talking about '98 trying to come up and and do a, a similar movement. Mm-hmm. I actually I actually gonna get that footage, and I think they're going to post on my website or something like that, and then people can get their own conclusions. They're going to see that that is there. It's not exactly how people do it right now, but the idea is right there. And you know, I'm pretty sure that, you know, people are going to begin to talk about that. That will be funny to see. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, were you yeah. happen to be at the, the Pan Ams? Yeah, I couldn't be there on the Pan Ams this time, man, unfortunately, because uh, I had a really big seminar tour uh, right before it to the Middle East, and then I went to a bunch of countries in Europe, so I had to give some attention here to my school, and uh, I couldn't be there. But, I mean, I saw the matches, and, uh, you know, as always, like, it's great to see Jiu-Jitsu evolving. It was great. You know, uh, it was a great tournament. All right. Well, well let's just touch on that real quick. Uh, what, what belt level impressed you the most? Uh, what was your favorite match, and what was the big trend this year? Uh, first, uh, you said, like, what was the belt that I, I trained the most? No, what belt level did you enjoy uh, matches watching the most? Oh, yeah, this time, it was, I mean, to be totally honest with you, in the Pan Ams this year, I just saw the black belts. I didn't see any lower belts uh, uh, matches. Uh, and uh, one match that I saw that I, I really liked, uh, it wasn't like a match that was a lot of points or or anything like that, but I matched that I really, really like to see the tactical aspect of that was uh, uh, Kyle Terra against uh, Malfasini. Oh, I really match. enjoy to see the, 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 the strategy that uh, Kyle Terra used, you know, and uh, it was definitely interesting to see because he was kind of like in a losing streak from uh, Malfasini. Malfasini was kind of beating him, I don't know, two or three times uh, consecutively. So it was fun to see that he changed a little bit his strategy and worked. It was, it was pretty cool to see. I, I really enjoyed the, the strategy and the technical part of that match. It was a really cool match. But, you know, the best match of all the tournament for sure was Clark Gracie's, the one that, you know, he was behind on points and then there were seconds left to finish the match. He choked uh, uh, his opponent out. It was awesome. Yeah. That match was, like, really, you know, like uh, emotional. It was pretty cool. Yeah, it was a beautiful match. And did yeah, you happen yeah. to see any big trends this year? What what was the the hot thing on the mat? Uh, man, like I still saw kind of the same tendency of the latest, uh, uh, um, you know, I would say latest pattern in jiu-jitsu. I mean, the lighter weights are kind of like really into the bidding bowl and the 50-50, you know, that things. And uh, I, I don't think it changed much. You know, I think it's still the same thing going on. But uh, definitely with the heavier weights, one thing that I've been noticing and this on this on this Pan Ams I saw a lot is that they're going more for foot locks and knee bars. You know, the, the big guys, like, or, or like back in, you know, a couple of years ago, they were all about being on top. You know, it was pretty much like a tug war <laughs> when, they, when they did their matches. Whoever got on top would win. And that's changing a lot. You know, we see guys like Boshisha, man, who's like a big guy and, and moves like a, you know, the featherweight, you know, going for foot locks all the time and doing these crazy positions from the bottom. And I saw a lot of the big guys beginning to do moves like, like leg attacks. So there's one, one thing that, it, you know, it popped on my eyes this time. I, I really paid attention on that. Nice. You, you said you were at a, a seminar. Um, when, when you go to a seminar and you see a mm-hmm. bunch of fresh faces, the, the rooms filled up and, and people are looking for you to uh, lead them and instruct them, uh, what, what's going on in your head right before you start a seminar and, uh, and, and how do you take control right away? What do, what do you tell them? Man, like uh, I've been doing this for so long that I'm kind of used to that. 
you know <laughs> sometimes I feel like I'm a, like one of these artists that, that like a band that's going to be playing live you know what I mean like uh, on the audience you have all kinds of people so what I try to do in a seminar is going to be something totally different than a class I always try to keep it like a fundamental idea and then I always show what I call like a ninja move, you know what I mean? <laughs> that I know that like maybe more than half of the class won't be able to do it, but anyways, they enjoyed something like that, to see something like that. So I'm going to keep it basic on a basic idea, but inside the basic, inside the fundamental, I'm going to show something flashy and something cool, you know? Not, I wouldn't say cool, I'm going to see something, something ninja, you know, so everybody gets happy because the advanced guy will, 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 will be really happy to learn a new thing, a new trick. And the other guys, even though they don't know, like, to do that, they're going to see, like, man, that was awesome. I like that. It's going to be kind of like a show. I think this seminar is, is very similar to a show, to be honest with you. You know, I feel good. I don't, I don't feel any pressure at all. I'm, I'm used to do that. Uh, how do you approach your jiu-jitsu? Like, do you like to play around or finish a job as quickly as possible? Uh, what do you mean, in a seminar? Well, in terms of like, um, well, I guess like rolling. Oh, training. rolling. Oh, okay. No, actually, uh, different than that. I, uh, I'm big into, uh, when I train, I'm really big into see what kind of training is going to have. You know, what, what kind of training I'm going to have. For instance, if I go with somebody that is like with a skill level like below mine, I'm all about doing like a long training and putting myself every time in really bad positions, you know. So I train pretty much my defense a lot. Uh, if I train in somebody, for example, uh, for example, Samuel, when Samuel comes around that has like almost an impassable guard, all I want to do is to try to pass his guard. You know what I mean? Like even if it's going to take like hours, it doesn't really matter. What I try to do in training is just always try to take something out of the training. You know, let's say, for instance, I'm going, to train, I'm going to train with a guy who has, like, a really great guard pass. You know, this training, that's, that's nothing online. There's no medals online, no titles, nothing. Why should I, you know, try to be on top of a guy like that? Why not feel the pressure? Why not try to get better on my jiu-jitsu and test my jiu-jitsu against a great guard passer like that? You know what I mean? So it, it, it's something that I always try to get every single training on my own benefit. You know, of course, sometimes when you're training for a student or you're, training, you're teaching a private class, you know, the training is going to be guided to them. But when I train for myself, I always try to do a training that's going to have uh, something productive. It's not going to be just a training that I'm going to, you know, just, just go there and try to beat the guy as fast as I can or try to, you know, impose my game. No, I'm always going to try to get something out of the training. That's how you get better in jiu-jitsu. Now, is it possible, let's say someone's a higher belt and uh, their school's filled with only white belts or, or you know, mid-level blues, mm -hmm. is it possible to always get better uh, with lower belts? Man, that's funny, but it is. It is possible. And let me tell you why. First, because when you teach techniques, you have to be 100% focused on teaching the perfect technique. And when you focus yourself to try to do a perfect technique, you will understand the technique better. And, and eventually, you're going to do the technique better yourself. And also, uh, there's another thing, like by training with lower level belts, uh, for example, that's my experience. I always try to, 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 when I do the training with them, I always try to do what I do worst. For example, if uh, I feel that my guard, my, my, let's say my De La Riva guard towards the left side is not being done properly uh, in training, that's all we're going to try to do with these guys. Because you know what? They, they can offer a lot of resistance, so you're going to be able to create confidence and do the techniques better, and then eventually you're going to get better. Also, another great way to do is that, like I said, put yourself in bad positions with them. And then like, work your way up little by little. So it is possible, yes, uh, and, you know, one of the living proofs of that is Roger Gracie, you know. Roger Gracie, you know, is probably the best competitor of all times, and he lives in London, you know. He lives in London, and he just, he, and he has a school that, you know, has some tough guys, but that's like a sea of whites and blue belts, and he was always able to keep his level growing, you know. So it is possible, yes. Uh, speaking of that, like, does where you live affect your BGJ training and how you perform in competitions? Or uh, is BGJ training 
the same all around the world and you can become a champion from anywhere without having to travel to big cities uh well the level of competition right now i'm gonna i'm not gonna lie uh it's not just about training the right way but you have to make sure that you have total understands about the rules and you have also total understand about what strategy you're going to use uh i really think that nowadays it's going to be probably one in a million that a person can win a competition without any strategy. Just go in there and smash everybody. I don't think it's going to happen again. You know, I think that uh, you have to, 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 to guide your training towards the rules of the competition, and you have to have really, really uh, uh, a clear strategy on your mind. And when I say a clear strategy, I mean plan A, plan B, plan C, and plan D. You know, you have to be ready to impose strategies on different opponents on different situations of the match. You know, so uh, I think they're more important nowadays, not more important, but as important as proper training is understanding of the rules and, uh, and uh, imposing of a strategy. That's very important nowadays if you want to be, you know, if you want to succeed in competition. Nice. Um, I was wondering, uh, the, the, the sport or the art has really, uh, I found changed over the years and, and especially with the influx of tournaments and, and competitions, I feel like it's becoming very sport driven. Uh, I wonder what your thoughts on that is and if self-defense still is as important and does that actually play a role in the sports side, in the competition, like if you're good at the self-defense, does this help you become better uh, at rolling or, or doing competition? Man, I totally agree with you. I mean, it was a question that you asked me, but I totally understand why you're asking me that because I think that, yes, uh, I see a little bit of a too dangerous uh, approach to only the sports side of jiu-jitsu. And this kind of concerns me a little bit, to be honest with you. Uh, I think jiu-jitsu is way more than competition only, okay? Uh, competition is a part of jiu-jitsu, a part that I enjoy, and a part that I was always, you know, really glad to, 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 to do it. But I see definitely people getting completely away from the basic uh, uh, foundation of the art, which is self-defense. You know, the beauty of jiu-jitsu, first of all, is that it's an art that uh, a weaker opponent can defend against a larger opponent, period. You know, that's, that's, that's the best uh, form of combat uh, by, when you have, like, a one-by-one -one fight. You know, like, it's amazing on how, like, understanding of the basics of jiu-jitsu is going to save your life if you need to. And I see that a lot of schools and a lot of, uh, uh, you know, a lot of uh, the new training methods are only towards competition. And, uh, and you see that, you know, like a very uh, easy way to see that, to see that new uh, pattern is when you see like some of these guys that are competing in MMA, you know. A lot of uh, modern jiu-jitsu competitors are going to MMA without any success. And why is that? Because I don't have a deep understanding about the, the foundation of the art, which is always self-defense, you know, so they're not able to practice jiu-jitsu in a way that's going to be effective for any situation. Uh, so I, I see a dangerous approach, and I saw what happened to other arts, such as taekwondo and judo, that are great arts, don't get me wrong, but they, they went to a, to a side that is totally sport. I mean, the self-defense aspect is that, and I, I, I think... I would never like to see that with jiu-jitsu. I always want to see the self-defense there. I teach for a long time. I've been teaching for like over 20 years, and uh, I never ne ne neglect, neglect, I'm sorry, that's part of, of training. I always taught self-defense for all levels, and uh, I think it's really uh, not important, but essential for, for keeping the art real, you know? Absolutely. I was also wondering, uh, when you came up and you were learning uh – let's say you're learning more of a sports side. Uh, did you guys implement, hey, if you are here instead of there, you could actually get punched in the face. Now, did you worry about controlling hands and head placement while learning a sports side? Did you guys always keep in mind that you could be punched in the, in the head on the ground? 
Uh, not really. I mean, when you're learning techniques that are completely competition-driven, we really don't worry too much about that. We focus on the rules of the competition, you know. But when you train jiu-jitsu uh, in a way that uh, you train like the overall aspect of that, you know, I always definitely pay attention to that. Uh, I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, when somebody has a fight or I have a fight, or we training like towards more uh, 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 self-defense or MMA situation, we tend to implement some of the new techniques applied to a real situation. So it's kind of the other way around. When I'm just like you know rolling around, relax in 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 in, in a in a class that is kind of competition driven, I really don't think about that too much. But when I go to the other reality that you know, I, I, let's say I have a fight coming up or something like that, then I try to visualize that. You know, we we train to we we tend to train even just the grappling part of uh, of you know MMA or self defense sometimes with light strikes because it gives you uh, gives you awareness and then you're gonna see if you're gonna be able to apply the new modern techniques or not on that situation. You know, but definitely, definitely, I uh, I pay attention to that, but I'm not gonna lie. You know, it's, gonna, it's not all the time. You know, I'm not gonna train. At every class or teach every class, like think about punch in the face. <laughs> that doesn't happen. Has there ever been a time where you had to defend yourself on the streets and to use your jujitsu? Yes, there was. Uh huh. A couple of times. Yes, sir. Uh, can you take us through that experience and how jujitsu saved you? Uh, yeah. I mean, there were there were a couple. <laughs> you know, uh, I had to defend myself uh, a couple of times. Uh, I think one time that, that, that really, uh, you know, crossed my mind was uh, when I was younger, you know, I, I probably was on the 16th uh, or 15 or 16 that, uh, that I, have a, I had a, a problem at the beach, you know, surfing uh, with a guy. And then this guy was an adult, you know, and, and you know, I, I'm, I'm not, you know, going to have to explain all that in the surfing world because some people don't understand. But I mean, on the surfing world, there's some, you know, some rules that uh, if you if you don't do the rules, it, it can be, you know, it can be a source of trouble, you know. And then that was the case. Uh, you know, this guy, you know, did something stupid there in the water, and then I complained to him, and then he told me to shut up, and then, you know, pretty much he shoved my head on the water, you know, like while I was paddling on my board. And then I went outside, and, I, and when I went outside on on the beach, and I was really mad, and he came right after. And uh, when, I, when I turned around, he just, you know, was ready to, to come and throw a punch. And, you know, he threw a punch, you know, a sloppy punch. And uh, my instinct, because of training by, back then, it was like a lot of self-defense, a lot of fundamentals, of course. You know, I pretty much dodged the punch, took him down, mounted him, beat him up, and I choked him out. You know, so, <laughs> you know, at the beach. And then it was like, it, it was really funny because uh, there was a lot of people watching, you know, and, and, and I, nobody interfered. Because there was a, a couple of friends of mine that didn't let anybody interfere, and uh, it was pretty funny because it was, the guy was like bigger than me, and uh, and a lot of people were kind of impressed. You know, they're really impressed because the guy passed out, and so people were like, "Oh my God, he's gonna die!" <laughs> but <laughs> it wasn't the case. You know, he woke up fast. But there was a lot of people that were kind of impressed on how like a small guy, like a small kid, like I was, could handle a situation like that. And then the cool thing is that after that, you know, I saw the guy again. And the guy looked at me and shake hands and apologize. You know, so it, it, was, it was a really cool thing. The guy was an adult. I learned after that he was like, I think, 21 years old or something. And uh, there was something that, 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 you know, showed me the first street fight is never good because you never can relax. You never can feel that, you know, you're walking on the street and something's going to happen to you. And that sensation is not very good at all. But at the, at the same time, it was a good lesson for me because it showed that the training that I was doing and uh, it showed me that I could defend myself if I need to, you know, so it was, it was a really cool thing. Uh, did this happen in Brazil? Yeah, in Brazil, yeah. I never had a fight in the U.S., man. <laughs> I, I came here, already, I was already like a, an adult and uh, I know better. I'm not going to have any street fights in here, period. <laughs> have, you ever, have you ever gotten in a street fight in Brazil and someone knew jiu-jitsu so you ended up having like a, a valley tudo fight instead uh in brazil yeah oh yeah <laughs> a thousand times <laughs> a lot of times uh, with with this being said uh i know you had a you tried your hand in mma 
And my question is, do you think that all practitioners of jiu-jitsu should try MMA or some sort of combat fight to, to see their, their skills unfold and, and if they really understand what they're doing? Uh, I, the, first of all, I think that nobody should be obligated to fight. And you're not going to prove that you're more men or less men fighting on the ring or in a cage. That, that's not the case. But at the same time, I was actually seeing, uh, watching an interview the other day from uh, this guy, uh, Robert Drysdale, and he said something really interesting. You know, he said that, uh, you know, going in a cage or in the ring to do an MMA fight, uh, it, it is, you know, uh, an experience that definitely every martial arts should try to do. He said that. Why? Because it's kind of like the extreme. You know, it's kind of when you really see when – and if your style is going to work or not. You know, like years and years of training martial arts, uh, you know, like and people saying, you know, telling you that this thing works or it doesn't work or that's the way you should do. There's no other way, that, no other better way for you to prove that and for you to experience that than in a ring or on the cage. You know, so I think that when you're losing, that's a valuable experience. But again, I don't think nobody should be obligated to do that. And I think, I, I really don't think that you are better or worse because you do it or you don't. You know, it's just like a pers personal choice. Uh, I really think that in my case, it was valid. I really enjoyed doing that. I really felt that, uh, you know, even though, you know, I tested my skills before in a, in a known MMA format way, I think it is a really good thing to do, and it gives you, like, a sense of accomplishment. I'm not going to lie. That's my opinion. Um, in your opinion, uh, what belt stage do you think it's appropriate to jump into MMA? Because you see a lot of the, the MMA fighters like uh, Hodger Gracie or Robert Drysdale competing at the black belt level in MMA. Now, are they doing it right, or are people doing it, you know, uh, too soon, like jumping in as a blue belt or a purple belt in MMA? Uh, I, I really think it's different nowadays. Uh, since MMA is so big that a lot of people come with like a different, um, a different background. You know, some people come with like a huge and a great wrestling background, and some people come with a really great big kickboxing background. And, uh, you know, they, 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 they are so good in that area that uh, they don't need to train, like, uh, extensively jiu-jitsu to be successful there. They need to train jiu-jitsu, of course, without, because without jiu-jitsu, you're dead. But uh, it's definitely a little different uh, right now. I wouldn't say, like, belt level in jiu-jitsu too much. As you see, for example, Joe Jones is the champion of UFC. He's a white belt in, in gi jiu-jitsu. And he submits black belts in jiu-jitsu. You know, but I do think that you have to have a strong foundation in one art at least. Uh, a lot of people say like modern MMA, you know, a lot of people talk about that and say like, oh, the right way to do it is to begin like since you're young to train off asses, fat sets of MMA. You know, you train a little bit of standing, a little bit of ground, a little bit of wrestling, a little bit of, you know, kickboxing. But uh, I really think that, uh, of course, for you to fight in a ring, you have to have an understanding of everything. But you always have to rely on something that you are an expert at. Uh, it can be either jiu-jitsu or kickboxing or mutai or karate or wrestling or whatever. But you definitely need to count with something that you really can say, okay, this is where I can count myself. And, and this is where I know that I'm going to be successful if I need to do that. You know what I mean? So uh, I kind of disagree with that approach. I think you have to have a solid foundation in one art before you do MMA. So belt level in jiu-jitsu uh, for the person to have, let's, let's suppose the person is a, a jiu-jitsu expert. Let's say that the person didn't have, doesn't have any uh, previous martial art background. So I would say, you know, a solid blue belt and to do some amateur fights, it should be enough. Thank you. That's a good answer. I agree with you. I, I think one strong suit is, uh, is the way to go. Um, I was wondering how uh, training during, I'm going to call it the golden era of uh, the headquarters of Gracie Baja. Can, can you take us through what it was like? And, uh, you know, how was, I mean, there's super teams supposedly now, but everybody that was on that team uh, at this moment are superstars in the, in the, the BJJ world. So how was training at the Gracie Baja, uh, the headquarters? Man, it was magical. 
you know, like, uh, and uh, since we're young kids, and uh, young kids don't, don't, don't tend to, to think too much about what's going on, and don't appreciate too much what's going on, but it was magical, man. I mean, I'm, I am so grateful and so happy and so lucky to be part of that. You know, I was on the mats with monsters, man. I was on the mats with the best in business. And uh, besides, like, uh, a huge laboratory of techniques, it was more, maybe more important than that, was like a, uh, it was like a school of life, that place. You know, like, I learned so much about jiu-jitsu philosophy, about life philosophy, about, you know, uh, fighting overall, jiu-jitsu, about everything on those mats. It was definitely kind of one of those uh, those things that happens like maybe once in every every century, <laughs> you know. Man, like I remember, there was like you know it was common to have days that we would have on the same match like Hanzo Gracie, Half Gracie, Jack Machado, Carlos Machado, Higa Machado, Helion Gracie, you know, High and Gracie, and it was like the, the, the kind of the new boys. It was me, Gordo, Soneca, uh, Marcel Feitosa, Soka. Uh, Holeta, Nino Chambri, man, you know, and the list goes on. You know what I mean? So it was definitely a magical time. And uh, and uh, you're right. I mean, a lot of a lot of people from that time and from that place are considered nowadays like uh, you know has like a high respect in the BJJ community. And I think that we, it was because of that. You know, I think it was because you were part of a magical moment. Uh, I think that. Uh, you know, uh, I don't know if that kind of, you know, level and that kind of, you know, group is going to be gathered again, <laughs> you know, like that kind of like level together. But I really hope so, because then jiu-jitsu is going to grow. But definitely, man, what, what happened on those mats now would spread all over the world. So it was something magical there for sure. Now, here's what I'm thinking. Uh, if I was you, I'm in the room with these people. My last name's not Gracie. Uh, I can never become something big or a name. Uh, did you ever imagine that you could run your own academy? Uh, I mean, you are very well known in, in the in the world of BJJ or the community that you uh, you know provide services for. Did when you're on the mats at Gracie Baja headquarters, you're young. Did you ever say, "Hey, man, I'm going to be able to run my own school and and I'm going to be giving seminars all over the world. Did you, did you ever imagine any of this? I did, man. I always imagined, and not just me, but everybody else uh, on the names that I told you before. You know why? It, because of the Gracies. Because uh, Master Carlos Gracie Jr. and Henzo and uh, all those guys that I told before, they always made us believe that this could be possible. You know, the level of confidence that we acquired in training there gave us the confidence that you can co we could conquer the world. You know, like uh, there was a lot of non-sayers non non even back then. There's always like people like that in life. You know, they're always going to say, oh, I, this can't be done. Oh, this is BS or whatever. Oh, jiu-jitsu is not, never going to be big. But actually, there was the opposite. You know, like my master, Master Carlos Gracie Jr., he is indeed, period, a visionary. He always told us that what's going on right now could be done. You know, he always told us, man, like jiu-jitsu can be huge. We can do tournaments in the United States. We can do like tournaments with like a thousand people and uh, everybody can you know, have successful schools and make a good living out of that. You know, we can have events of MMA that's going to be broadcast all over the world. And guess what? You know, what he said is actually happening now and actually in, in, a, in a bigger way. You know, so they always, like, always gave us total confidence that we could make it, you know, and that's what happened. So actually, actually it was the opposite. I never felt uh, a little in the middle of all these monsters. I, al I always felt like part of them. I always felt important, and uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad because of that. That's amazing. Um, I was just wondering... You know, a lot of people now are coming up with these apps and uh, online training. But you, you seem to be one of the, the first people to kind of take advantage of uh, the Internet training and, and start your own training. So tell people maybe how they could uh, watch you there. And, and, and what, were your, uh, what did you want to accomplish by starting your online training? Uh, 
man, like uh, you're right. I was one, maybe one of the first to do this uh, this project. You know, to be part of one of these projects, the uh, online training. And uh, I really think that uh, the internet is probably one of the most uh, important inventions of all times. I really think. You know, it connected the world like pretty much minute by minute. You know, you can know what's going on live anywhere in the world by your phone pretty much. This is amazing. And uh, the internet uh, can be the perfect supplementary tool for you to learn good jiu-jitsu. You know, don't get me wrong. Nothing's going to change the fact that you have a great professor and you are on the mats with this professor and great training partners. That's that's the only way for you to be good in jiu-jitsu. You're not going to be great in jiu-jitsu watching video, uh, videos in YouTube. That's not going to happen. But uh, definitely you can supplement. Definitely you can do an upgrade on your training by online training, such as my, such as uh, DraculinoBJJTraining.com. So uh, it is for sure amazing on how I get good feedback, great feedback from people that, that participate on this, 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 this training website on how they, you know, correct their details on how they, they got some guidance and how they're going to train. But don't get me wrong, man. I mean, if you're not on the match, you're not going to get better. <laughs> Only watching videos won't save you. Of course. Have you ever had the, the privilege of someone coming up and, and thanking you for what you showed and you never even met them? Man, it happens pretty much every week. <laughs> how, how, how does that feel? I get, it. I get emails every, every, almost every week and sometimes more than one a week. And, uh, and I, get, I got people coming down uh, because, you know, they, they, they saw the website and they come and train. They want to train, you know, live with me and all that. This is pretty much, this is actually pretty common. How, how does it feel? And, and how do you stay grounded? And I'm not going to lie, if, if I had that happening, my head would probably swell up so big. Uh, <laughs> I, I couldn't fit in the room right now. How, how do you... <laughs> How do you maintain to uh, to stay humble and, and not feel uh, better than than most people? You know, man. Uh, first of all, I learned in my life since I was young that uh, everybody's the same. You know, you're no different than anybody. You bleed like everybody. You sweat by everybody. You suffer by everybody, and you have joy like everybody else. You know, so uh, thinking that you're different from any reason. It's silly and stupid because, you know what, when you begin to feel like that, life will teach you otherwise. You know what I mean? So uh, I always felt also uh, also the great examples that I have, of, of course, first for my family, that I have a great family. You know, my mom and dad raised me like in a great way and always uh, telling me and leading me by great examples that you always should be humble no matter what because you're no different than anybody but also by uh uh training jiu-jitsu too you know like training with the graces the graces who are kind of like like the candidates in brazil you know super famous and you know the toughest guys uh on the country and all that but they always had like such a, a humble approach with everybody else that it was amazing you know so they led by example a lot of some people tend to think that some of the graces are cockies or or you know they're kind of arrogant but in reality, I, I, I was noticing that it's not the case. They're just confident, you know, because I saw uh, situations where, you know, they treated people so well, so good, and they didn't need to do that. You know, they just did it for the sake of doing it, you know. And, uh, and it comes back to uh, one of the sayings that of uh, Grandmaster Carlos Gracie Sr., that he says that you have to treat people the way you, you would like to be treated. You know, and that stick to my mind until today. You know, you have to you you have to make sure that you're always down to earth, no matter what. You know, and and, and I live for this model until until now. And a lot of people ask me kind of the same question. Man, you you, you achieve like really you know really great things, and you, you know you have this, you have that. You know, you're all well known and all that. And you know, I I don't really feel uh, flattered by that. I don't really feel like too much anything about it to be honest with you i just feel that i'm a regular person and i thank god that god gave me you know you know the the, the gift to do what i do you know right and uh and just keep going man i mean i i don't i don't let my head grow big because of that i only, I only get my head big when i see my kids getting great accomplishments i'm not gonna lie <laughs> 
uh, we're really far into this conversation, but your your nickname, Draculino, how did you get that nickname? Man, this is an old story. I got this nickname a long time ago from a math teacher. I was probably, uh, I don't know if I was eight or nine. I don't recall exactly. But uh, I, I, I do remember exactly the moment, though. Uh, it was a math class. And then uh, during this math class, I was kind of like a talkative teacher. A talkative t- kid, you know, I was kind of like all over the place a little bit. And then uh, this math teacher was like, hey, you, you boy, you know, you know, stop talking. And I was like, okay. And then he goes like, you look like a little Dracula, Draculino. Because in Portuguese, Inho, Draculino means little Dracula, something, you know, little something. Let's say your name is uh, is Carl, you know, in Brazil, they call you, they call you Carlinho, you know. So they call he called me Draculino, but some reason for some reason it changed to Draculino, you know, because some people begin to, to to you know to call me like that, and then all of a sudden you know there was a mis misunderstanding or a miscommunication there, and then people begin to call me Draculino, and of course I didn't like it. I didn't like the nickname, especially coming from a math teacher, for Christ's sake, you know, <laughs> it wasn't cool. And uh, and then because I didn't like it, it stuck to me. And then, you know, nowadays I gl- I'm glad that it, it, it stuck because you know it's a great uh, marketing tool for me. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> is, is it true that uh, usually all the nicknames for the people and like all the fighters that have nicknames, uh, usually they don't actually like the nicknames. It just you have to whatever you're given, you have to accept. Pretty much, man. Uh, Are they really this, all usually everybody like that got nicknames in jiu-jitsu, I can guarantee to you they didn't like it at first. That's why it stuck to them. Because if you, if you invented a, a nickname to somebody and this person thinks the nickname is awesome, well, of course nobody's going to call him that, name, that nickname. <laughs> it's not going to happen. You know what I mean? Like, so everybody that has a nickname, in, in, not just in jiu-jitsu, but everywhere in Brazil, I can bet my life that they didn't like it, for sure. Definitely. Um, at first, you were saying, at first, I would say that at first, because now I like Draculino. Yeah, of course. Uh, you're saying how you now embraced it and you're you're thankful for it, and you know you have a one of the best uh, logos I've ever seen attached to somebody's name. Uh, how important uh, was it for yourself to kind of brand Draculino and and, and everything kind of be all tied in together? Uh, did you have any background in marketing? Like a lot of people weren't, weren't doing that before. Uh, you know, a lot of people didn't have their own logos and everything tied together the online, like what made you want to step outside the box and, uh, do that? To be honest with you, man, I don't have any background in marketing and I was never really good on it. To be honest with you, I was just lucky enough to be surrounded by people that had that vision and they came to me with good ideas. You know, that's pretty much what happened. Uh, the logo of the bat, it's, it's pretty funny because it was a long time ago back in Rio, in Brazil, that I had a student. He was one of, one of my private students. And uh, I was like a, a recent uh, black belt. And, he was, and I, I always, like every school that I taught in my life, it was always a Gracie Baja school. You know, it was always like a, a branch of Gracie Baja, and I'm proud of that. You know, until today, all my schools are branches of Gracie Baja, the name of the school, and that's the school and the flag that I represent. But uh, I remember that this student of mine, he was like, man, Jacqueline is such a cool name. You have to have a logo for that. And I was like, okay, but, you know, what, what do you have in mind? Of course, he said, of course, it has to be a bat, something with the bat. And then he came with some designs. And then this design of this new bat is his. And when I saw it, man, like, it just clicked. I was like, man, that looks really, really cool. I just want to make sure that I don't, have in tr- I don't get in trouble with the Batman logo, the official Batman logo. But it wasn't the case, you know, because it's, it's way different if you notice. So uh, it was pretty much it. And uh, we begin, you know, to, again, like some people that had, like, good, you know, good vision of marketing. And I was lucky enough to be around them. They they begin to have some good ideas with that and uh, and nowadays it's 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 something that a lot of people not just you like tell me that man I think it's really cool, you know not just the name but the the the, the bat symbol and I use the bat symbol for like a, a, a line clothing and also the 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 BJJ website uses that symbol too and uh, I'm glad with that man and and I mean uh, I've been doing some really cool stuff with that so 
uh, I'm really, you know, actually lucky to have these people to help me out because if you depended on me, brother, we're not going to have anything right now. <laughs> I'm not really good at that, to be honest with you. That's a good story. It's nice to hear. Um, I was actually curious. You just mentioned something I was actually going to get around to was how you take pride in always having the Gracie Baja flag uh, always sticking within them. Uh, how was that ever a difficult thing to do for you or there's no doubt about it? This is where you always wanted to be and represent. There was never any question about it. Uh, first of all, because uh, uh, I trained at Gracie Baja pretty much all my life, all my adult life and a teenager life. And then uh, I don't know a place besides home because at home, like with my great family, they taught me like the most precious uh, blessings in life. But besides home, there wasn't a place that I learned more about life and about about everything in life than uh, at Gracie Baja. You know, I always had uh, great uh, friends, some of my best friends ever uh, until today uh, were were there since the beginning at the match of Gracie Baja. Also, uh, the support that I have for my, my that I had for my instructors, for my professors. Uh, first, uh, Jean-Jack Machado, then uh, Master Carlos Gracie Jr. And, uh, you know, with the help of others like Hansel Gracie too, you know, uh, but mainly Master Carlos Gracie Jr., he's a master of all of us. Uh, they, he, he always believed on me and uh, he always gave me the tools to make sure that I could succeed in jiu-jitsu, in jiu-jitsu and live my dream. So uh, I just have good things to say about Master Carlos Gracie Jr. and about Gracie Baja. And uh, why leave this, the, the, the organization uh, for, you know, if I just have good things to say about it, and if it only brought me joy and happiness, you know. I'm really proud to be Gracie Baja, and, uh, and I always, uh, I'm always happy and proud to, to be part of the team and nowadays to be one of the oldest guys in the organization. And uh, I plan to keep that forever, for sure. Yeah, you, you just mentioned one of the oldest guys and you're only, what, 40 years old? Yeah, I'm 40, actually going to be 42 in July. Do you find that unreal that you're, con- uh, you're not even old, first of all, but like you're one of the <laughs> oldest <laughs> Thank you. In the, under the banner? Do you find that weird? Because at 41, I, I assume you're still in fairly great shape. Yeah, thank God. I mean, <laughs> I always like took care of myself. I always took care of my body. I was, uh, you know, trained pretty much every day, and I did, you know, all the sports and physical condition. Uh, I'm saying kind of older. One of the oldest guys in Gracie Baja. I meant oldest in in their in their organization. You know, a lot of people come and go. You know, a lot of people uh, begin to train jiu jitsu and then they 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 go to another route and all that. And I was a guy that always stayed and uh I'm, I'm still there today until today you know so um uh you know you, you're right i'm not old you know <laughs> i'm just 42 years old but uh i've been doing jiu-jitsu for a long time you know i've been doing jiu-jitsu since i was 13 so i think you know when you stick to to something that long you know you, ha- you got some benefits and you got some recognition so you know i'm really proud of that never Absolutely. changed teams all right. Uh, how about I'm gonna just name a, a couple names here, and whatever comes to your mind right away, just just blurt it out. All right. Okay. Uh, Hicks and Gracie. The real samurai. Nice. Uh, Master Carlos Gracie uh, Jr. My one and only master, and the visionary. Marcio Feitosa. One of the best competitors of all time and great strategist. A strategist. Hanzo Gracie. My hero. <laughs> yeah. Nino Chambriri. One of the most brilliant. Uh, let, let me put it like in a slow. Let me see. Let me see. Uh, a prodigy. Pro, uh, 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 how did prodigy know? Let me see. Prodigy. Like uh, a phen- phenom. Phenom. Let's yes. say phenom. Huh. John Jock Machado. Um, John Jock. Uh, technique at its finest. 
Draculino. Just a stubborn old guy that trains jiu-jitsu, you know, trains jiu-jitsu forever. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, we're going to have to, to close this up soon. Uh, this has probably been, uh, man, this has been one of my favorite interviews ever. Um, I was just wondering if you could just plug whatever you want. This time, you know, your websites, uh, how people could find out more about you, uh, you know, whatever you want to plug upcoming stuff just uh now's your time okay uh first of all thank you very much for the opportunity it was a great interview uh you asked great questions that you know came a little bit out of the ordinary that sometimes you get a little tired to answer the same questions but you did a great job um uh I, if you guys want to you know check it out a little bit of more information about my schools and and about me and about you know the training website and all that Please access uh, www.gracybahatx.com. TX is Texas. GracieBahatx.com. Or you can access also www.traculino.com. Then they have some information about, you know, the, 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 the training website and how the curriculum is done and all that stuff. Uh, again, it's always a pleasure to share a little bit of, of our knowledge in jiu-jitsu uh, through, uh, you know, guys like you that know what they're doing. You know what I mean? It's a great honor. And uh, I'm open to talk to anybody at any time. You guys feel free to reach me. I'm in Facebook. I'm in Twitter. I'm more than happy to interact with everybody. That's amazing. Uh, just one last question, actually. I was wondering, since you came to America, uh, have you gotten into the how big the NFL is? And are you a fan of the, the Houston Texans? Uh, man, to be honest with you, I live in the, in the state that is like football is like a religion here. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's crazy. Like you go to, to high school games and there's like 10,000, 15,000 people. It's like unbelievable. I was like, man, I couldn't believe that. But let me, I'm going to be totally honest with you. I'm not really into football too much. I like jiu-jitsu and surfing way too much to like something else. And MMA too, of course. But, uh, but uh, of course, you know, if I need to root for one team, I'm going to root for the, for the Houston Texas because it's my hometown. So, uh, for sure, that's my team. <laughs> Let's put it this way. Uh, my last question. Uh, uh -huh. You do jiu-jitsu. I think you like that. Um, if there was another martial art that you could do, what would it be? Uh, if I couldn't train jiu-jitsu or if I, tr if I would train jiu-jitsu and something else? Uh, and something else. Uh, or man, to be honest, you know, to be honest with you, I always train more than one martial art all the time. I always train judo, I always train wrestling. In the morning today, I train Muay Thai, I've been training Muay Thai, I train boxing. I train a lot of things. But if I would stick to one, to another one, I would definitely say wrestling. Yes. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I love wrestling. Wrestling is good. Yeah, wrestling is great, man. I mean, I wish I, I mean, my body could take it a little better because, you know, sometimes there's some injuries that Wrestling can be brutal. It's a great sport, but it can be brutal. So your body needs definitely to be ready. Absolutely. Well, we're going to have to wrap this up now. I really appreciate uh, the time you've taken out of your day to, to speak with us. Uh, we'll have this up on uh, YouTube in a couple hours. We'll have the iTunes cool. going soon. So uh, we'll send that all to you. And uh, thank you once Perfect. again. And hopefully we speak again. Of course, my brother. It was my pleasure. Please send the link to me or tweet me or Facebook me, and then I'm going to spread the word around and, and see how people, you know, get the feedback. I'm We're pretty sure they're going to like it. It was the really internet cool. with your, your interview. Don't worry. All right, man. I appreciate right, it, you. brother. Thank you very much for the opportunity, okay? Same. Take Bye. care. Bye-bye. Um, Bye. <laughs> Who knows there was two of us, right? <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> Sometimes I don't even know. Well, we forget to tell people when we start, eh? So, well, Jer, Oops. that concludes an, another episode of Big Jack Radio. Yeah, it started off shaky, but it was really good. God damn. You know what, though? It didn't start off shaky for the people that are listening to it right now. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? We, yeah. uh, we got it all taken care of. But if they were with us since, like, the start of seven, then, yeah, it might have been shaky. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, oh, you know there. what? Uh, you know how he said, like, he liked the questions we asked? Yeah. 
I purposely didn't want this to be a history lesson because yeah. it's bo- like he said, it would have been boring for him. But you know what, man? I like that he said that because I for this one specifically, I tried to I try to look at stuff that was already out there on him and not ask those again. I kind of hope by now people listen to our show or tune in, know who Draculino is, and they don't need to know that you know, he competed at the the Worlds in the day or, you know what I mean? So I, I try to, well, you know we try, we, I should say, not at me, but myself also, I try to ask stuff that are relevant, but like kind of different. You know how our questions work, right? I don't know if... Uh, it's hard, don't you find though? Well, I mean, well, our formula for asking questions is that we don't write down questions. We, we kind of just go with the flow of how or what they're saying and we'll throw in... Today I wrote bullet points. I was nervous. Yeah, man. I mean, I was nervous to talk to him. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, he's obviously in a whole different level of mindset uh, yeah. to the questions that we could ask, you know, organically. So I think. Uh, yeah. But yeah, usually we just kind of. No, I don't want to. Just not. It's not that we don't care. I just think it. We want to make it sound more like a natural conversation. Yeah, that's what that's what we strive for. Yeah, but today, like, I had to put bullet points because. There's a couple times there's stuff I say I'm going to ask and I, I literally forget to ask and then I'm really pissed off at myself. So yeah. today I had bullet points. So yeah. uh, You know what? It's a good time to end the episode Oops. with our little banter of organic talk and uh, hopefully people stayed on to the whole thing and I appreciate that and uh, thank you again to uh, Mr. Dracolino who doesn't even need a full name now. That's all he needs. Imagine getting to that point. Yeah. That's all you need? Like, <laughs> if people didn't even know my name was David Carroll, I would love it. If I'm, I could just go as real DWC, I would do it. <laughs> so, all right. So, thank you, everyone, once again. Uh, man, this was a blast. And uh, tune in next week. Uh, it should be April 9th, I believe. Uh, same time, 7 p.m. Eastern, live. Uh, BJ Attic Radio, Fight Fans Radio. And... Uh, that's it, man. I want more people on Facebook, please. Uh, get out there and start tweeting and talking to us. And uh, we need your feedback. We need to know what you guys uh, hate. And if you really do hate something, actually don't tell us because we can't take it. But tell us what you love and uh, and what you want to see upcoming. I know we just got requests for, like, uh, Hanato Laraj. Let me tell you guys, we're going to try our best to get them. Uh, man, that was the big request lately. And what else? Um, yeah, it's, um... Didn't we have another person, like, people asked for? And anyways, Hanato Laraj was next on the list. Oh, yeah, Hanato was. And, uh, we're gonna try our best to get that. I wanna get Marcelo uh, Garcia. If you guys can get Marcelo Garcia for us, we would love to interview him. Yeah, like, just shouting out, maybe it'll happen. Maybe Jacqueline could reach out to these people. Uh, yeah. no, but honestly, yeah, him, uh, I wanna speak to... Uh, give me three, Hiron Gracie. Give me three people. I want to speak to Hiron Gracie. Hiron Gracie. Uh, he's up at the top of the list. Uh-huh. Uh, I would really like to speak to uh, Jeff Glover. Jeff Glover. And uh, Mike Fowler, man. These, see, these are like, this is weird because these are people I want to just personally talk to. But yeah. Hiron's top of my list right now, now that I spoke to uh, Draculino. So, oh, cool. yeah, you, top three right now. Top three, Marcelo Garcia would be one. Yeah. Uh, two would probably be Hobson Mora. Oh, man, as if I didn't even name Hobson. Go on. Hobson Mora. Uh, and my third and final one would be a tie between Andre Galval. Yeah. And also, um, oh, man, the third one. I haven't thought of a third one. Well, you already named five people, so go on. Uh, and- some, some, some. Maybe the Menda or a Cobrino would be a good one. Nice. I respect that. Uh, guys, be on the lookout for my uh, mockumentary I'm going to make soon uh, called The Other Mendez Brother. Uh, it's a concept uh, about they were actually triplets, and uh, the third one never did jujitsu, so we'll follow his life. <laughs> really? No, it's a mockumentary, uh, which is like a, a joke documentary, but this is my thought I just made, so tune out for that. All right, let's wrap this up. Hang tight, tight dudes. dudes. Yo. One love, baby. Two loves. <laughs>